All right. Uh, welcome to the first uh, Quake Core uh, seminar of our um, seminar series that will be running monthly from here on from here on out. Uh, my name is Ken Elwood. I'm the director of Quake Core here at the University of Auckland, and um, we see we've got people from around the globe already joining us today. So that's uh, very exciting for this first uh, seminar. Uh, and the whole idea of the seminar series is to showcase uh, some of the multidisciplinary work that we're doing within Quake Core. And uh, we thought the, the best way to kick this off is to have uh, Jason Ingham, who is the uh, former uh, lead of uh, Flagship 3 on earthquake vulnerable buildings, uh, speak to us on the breadth of work that he's done uh, both before and during Quake Core. Uh, related to unreinforced masonry buildings. Um, Jason has now moved on to, to bigger and uh, bigger things as, as my boss as head of department at uh, University of Can uh, University of Auckland, uh, civil engineering department. I don't think he needs uh, much introduction to, to, the, to the whole um, uh, audience here online today. So uh, to leave as much time as possible for Jason, and his presentation. Uh, with no further ado, here's here's Jason. Thanks, Ken, and uh, hello, everybody out there. It's a great pleasure to be able to present this uh, first Quake Core webinar. The background to this uh, project is really uh, associated with what happened in the Canterbury earthquakes and the extensive devastation to the unreinforced masonry buildings in Christchurch. And Quake Core recognizing that it wanted to do a cross flagship case study associated with the Alpine Fault. And within Flagship 3, we elected to focus on precincts of unreinforced masonry buildings in other parts of the South Island. So I first want to uh, introduce the project team. We have uh, five PhD students working on this, four of them based out of Auckland on the top row Paco, Shannon, Mustafa, and Stacey. Stacey's from architecture and uh, Paco, uh, Shannon and Mustafa are all from engineering and Will is at Otago working um, with Caroline Orcheston. We also, in addition to myself, have a number of other staff associated with the project. So David Johnston's at GNS in uh, Massey, Wellington. Kevin Walsh is long distance from the United States. Nick Hurstpool at GNS and Caroline Orcheston from the University of Otago. also want to acknowledge them plus the fact we're working with a number of councils and other organizations. I should say that I'm intentionally going reasonably quickly through this. We've got quite a number of slides. So the uh, conception for the project was to integrate between all the various flagships as much as possible. Flagship one and its integration with ourselves is probably the most important link. So um, flagship one are generating the seismic simulations we're using for our studies. Our interaction with Flagship 2 has not yet begun and, and is looking to lag, but the intent there is that after we've got our modeling scenarios up and running, we want to see if we can explore incorporating um, ground damage effects into our modeling, which we haven't yet begun. We're obviously Flagship 3 looking at existing buildings, and the intent is that Flagship 4 would run in parallel with our project looking at uh, a second stock of buildings being multi-story concrete buildings that also have been proven to be vulnerable in large earthquakes. That's happening out of flagship four. And hopefully the results of what I will be presenting you today will be meaningful for flagship five in terms of issues such as planning, coordinating and preparing. So the background for the uh, selection of this case study scenario is uh, recognition that in loose terms, the Alpine Fault ruptures roughly every 300 years and last ruptured 300 years ago. And so it's very plausible to suggest that there could be an Alpine Fault earthquake more or less at any time, at least in geological language. And that we would review the building portfolio of the South, South Island and establish um, some case study project areas. Now that project was never intended to completely capture all the building inventory of the South Island. 
But um, excluding Dunedin, which has a very large stock of unreinforced masonry buildings, we've um, been fortunate that we've been able to add extra people onto the team. And by the time we finish, we should have reviewed most uh, precincts in the South Island. So we've already completed Omaru, Winton, Invercargill and Matara, which are all uh, in the south. And uh, we're about to hit the west coast next. So you can see uh, in the circles on this map, uh, the sites that we're heading towards. Now the general plan is as shown here. The idea is that we collect our building inventory data and it would be nice if that data already existed and you simply had to um, speak with the councils and collect it, but it doesn't. And so we have to do site visits and uh, anything we can do web-based to collect that information. As I've discussed already, Flagship One are providing us with our seismic simulations. We are then operating uh, in the engine room of developing fragility curves, vulnerability models, and a lot more work that I'll be telling you about today. We put all this into the RiskScape engine and we generate outputs. And obviously the quality of the outputs is linked to the quality of the inputs. And so one of the features of this project that I'd like to explain to you is um, just the level of sophistication we're bringing to the, the quality of the inputs and the quality of the modeling, hopefully. The project has four objectives. So the first one really is to uh, review everything we can learn from the Christchurch building uh, failure experience, to bring on board as much new technology as we can, which has been very excited and uh, I look forward to explaining that to you. To bring in uh, a multidisciplinary focus around architecture, heritage, intersections with tourism and uh, other aspects. And then finally, the human dimension associated with people behavior, pedestrians, casualty models, and how we plan accordingly for that. So to begin, I'm going to discuss what we've learned from Christchurch and how we use that information. And for better or for worse, it transpires that uh, since the Canterbury earthquakes, we have collected what is thought, I think, internationally to be the most comprehensive data set associated with the performance of unreinforced masonry buildings that's ever been able to be collected. Uh, largely because of the density of the buildings in the central city in Christchurch and the fact that funding was made immediately available for us to document what had happened. So our building database has 629 buildings in it. We think we may have lost about 10 along the way simply because demolition crews got in there ahead of us being able to document things. We have a vast amount of photographic data. And from this, we can do quite a lot of stuff. So you can see down below that at the very um, loosest level, information reported at the Canterbury Earthquakes Royal Commission was correlating the performance of buildings in the earthquakes when they uh, had received different levels of seismic retrofit. But for each of those buildings, we've continued over time to add more and more information back to each building. So we are able to find its location, match that to different parameters associated with seismic input. So that might be, um, accelerations, velocities, or other dimensions associated with shaking at the site. We were able to describe how the building performed, and uh, there's quite a number of different variations you can do that. But I'm gonna refer quite a lot today to the damage grades you can see here in front of you. If you're not familiar with them, it's rather sort of self-obvious. Uh, grade one is negligible through to grade five being total destruction. So I'm going to begin talking about what we're doing in the fragility space. Um, a lot of people online will be very familiar with fragility curves. Basically, there can be three different forms depending on what data you have available. We're focusing largely on empirical data, actually observed, documented, and recorded. But we are also um, simulating uh, what, what actually happened with numerical uh, simulations as well. And sometimes expert judgment is made when necessary. And from these curves, again, uh, as widely known already, we can forecast building damage, but we were looking to do quite a lot more than that if we can. So we are looking to forecast um, debris fall zones, help use that information to help identify cordoning issues and road closure, 
Uh, we're doing as much as we can around forecasting uh, fertilities and injuries in buildings. And although it's not in this project, these curves can also be used for recovery times, recovery costs. So we have a very large data set. I've mentioned this to you already. And one of the unfortunate features of the empirical data is that because the buildings were so closely clustered, they were all subjected to roughly the same level of acceleration. So this top left graph that you can see here shows that uh, unfortunately, based upon our um, seismographs that were in Christchurch, we get a very large amount of spike data at a single acceleration point. And that correlates down below in the bottom graph on the left. Then when we try to plot this as an empirical data set, we um, get quite a crude sort of leap in the curve, as you can see there for the blue line. So having given this some thought, we've elected to work through the fact that we won't use measured seismic input to the buildings, but instead we'll use the simulated seismic input coming out of our simulations. So the idea now is that we get ourselves prepared, given that flagship one is still working through its simulations, and then as those simulations come online, we can bring the simulated level of shaking in Christchurch, companion that up to our measured damage data, and then use those relationships now to match up with the simulations for the rest of the South Island. And it has the uh, attractive advantage, if you have a look at the graph on the bottom right, that the simulations give us more finesse or um, smoother curves because now we are able to see variations in the seismic inputs across our portfolio of buildings that were occurring in Christchurch. Those curves you can see at the bottom, just an example, we're generating a single curve there for damage level four. So when we're finished, we come up with a, quite a, an extensive way of presenting this information. All I'm showing here with these two plots now is that we can uh, use, for instance, peak ground velocity or peak ground acceleration. And in fact, because um, flagship one is generating the data with so many different ways of describing the seismic input, we are similarly able to um, have quite a, a vast number of different ways of plotting it. So for now, the assumption is that between fundamental behavior associated with what metrics make sense in terms of building performance, but also which metrics give us best correlations, those will be the ones that we'll be using in our simulations. And so we already have now, having completed this work, um, quite an extensive number of fragility curves specifically for unreinforced masonry buildings. But we are able to do really quite a bit more than has been available in the past. So at the least what you're looking at here is for a two-story unreinforced masonry building for five different damage states. Um, and if we were looking in the top left peak ground acceleration, top right peak ground velocity, bottom uh, left uh, spectral acceleration at one second, bottom right um, modified Michaeli intensity. And those are only a subset of what we have available to us. But we're also now able to generate curves for one-story buildings, for two-story buildings, for corner buildings, for row buildings. We have quite a lot that we can do with the data that we have available to us. I remind you again, the reason these aren't yet final is because Flagship One hasn't yet finalized its simulation of what happened in the Canterbury earthquakes. But because this is all um, automatically generated now, we can update these curves at any time. It really just takes a few pushes of the button. So that's reasonably standard technology and uh, has been presented at conferences for quite some time. Moving forward, what we're wanting to do is a little bit more finesse, if you want, around the idea that describing a building by its damage level is, is quite a coarse metric, but in terms of the impact upon the occupants or the people around the building, we need to be a little bit more refined. And so the first thing we're doing is for each building we have in our data set, going back and describing what is referred to as volume loss with the notion that volume loss is uh, a meaningful parameter for forecasting what would happen to occupants inside the building. So you can see here some examples. 
taken from published work by others, but all of these buildings are suggested to have collapsed, and yet the one on the left is only 10% loss of volume, the one, middle one 50% loss of volume, the last one 100% loss of volume. So we're doing that for all 629 buildings in our data set. And we also have, um, obviously, the real world data associated with the deaths and injuries. So although everyone's very aware that the CTV, CTV building um, was responsible for the largest number of deaths in Christchurch, we do have that there were a significant number of deaths associated with unreinforced masonry buildings. Sometimes these were uh, deaths to occupants inside the building or to people outside the building. In some cases, it was a single death, in other cases, multiple. So we have this information. We also have what is referred to as the RISE data set, working with the health professional people associated with um, the ongoing uh, medical treatments associated with people in the Canterbury earthquakes. And this work is uh, the stuff that David Johnson's assisting with. And um, we haven't fully uh, integrated that into our work yet, but we are tracking more than just the deaths themselves, but other aspects associated with continuing uh, health issues. So when this is concluded, the way it works is uh, we can generate a number of relationships on the left. Here is an example taken from some other people's works just to demonstrate what it will look like when it finished. Here there's uh, shown on the left a relationship between peak ground acceleration and volume loss. Uh, we're still generating our curves, but you obviously come up, come across. And then on the right, you're able to demonstrate that for a given level of volume loss and a given level of occupancy either in or around the building, what are our fatality ratio forecasts? And you can see already on the right-hand plot that we have actual data that we're able to populate this with. It'll come up again later, but one of the difficulties we have currently uh, is the people side of the story. So the human element of how many people are in a building or around a building, what we refer to as pedestrian behavior, and uh, as a bunch of engineering um, researchers, um, it hadn't really been on our radar initially to get quite so extensive into just the human modeling where people are, what time of the day, what time of the month, what time of the year. Um, and that data is not particularly easily accessible in New Zealand. So for now, it may be that we have to make some um, judgment calls and over time, that might be some work we need to improve on. Another piece of data that um, we think is reasonably unique is because we have such a rich photographic history, we have uh, a capture of where all the debris landed from each of the building failures. So here in the center, you're seeing four different buildings on a block and where the debris all landed. There's quite a strong directionality effect in the Canterbury earthquakes. And so we're recording that as well. So um, if we are able over time to account for directionality, here's just some examples of what it's beginning to look like in terms of the building height and the distance the debris fell. And uh, the north walls generally fill the furthest because that's part of the directionality effect of the epicenter being on the south side of the CBD. You put all this together and it helps to um, develop our understanding of coordinating. So the logic we're sort of applying until we have better information available is that cordons, at least in the first sense, immediately after the earthquake are very much dictated by where the debris is lying on the roads and in the streets. And uh, on the bottom left, you can see a relationship that really did come out of the Canterbury earthquakes and has already been published that uh, the debris can land up to one and a half times the distance of the building. And uh, you can see quite quickly then if you start thinking about how tall buildings are and how quite wide streets are, that it's quite obvious that in many cases, uh, the, the debris from collapsed unreinforced masonry buildings can be expected to close roads completely. So we're quantifying all that in a way that hasn't been available in the past. At the same time, we're wanting to use the data we have to do a new piece of work as a bit of an add-on 
in New Zealand, we have a seismic assessment procedure for unreinforced masonry buildings called um, a rather uninteresting name called Section C8 of the EQ Assess documentation set. We're aware that we don't have a methodology yet nationally for how to analyze complex masonry buildings. Internationally, uh, particularly in Europe and Italy in, in particular, there is a procedure called the macro block method that was developed for things like complex cathedrals and palaces. The, um, the abacus for these macro blocks is shown on the top, and so you can get a sense of what they look like. Many of these have only limited relevance to New Zealand because we simply don't have sophisticated cathedrals and palaces uh, of that style in any great number. But the procedure, um, caught my attention over time as we saw both in the Canterbury earthquakes and more recently in Nepal, again and again, how buildings do keep collapsing in the same way. And so this is work that Paco is leading around correlating the observed damage to the buildings in Canterbury for each case, uh, tying it back to the macro block failure mode that was observed. So you can see here the graphics associated with that and what we're able to then do is get a statistical capture of the macro blocks that are likely to be most commonly encountered across our national building stock. And so you can see the sorts of things you'd be anticipated. Uh, top facade overturning is currently coming out top. Parapet failure is coming out close behind, et cetera. And there'll be many modes in the Italian abacus that really are uh, not appearing because we really don't have towers and uh, large dome structures, et cetera. So this work is a little bit outside the, uh, the intent of the cross flagship uh, project, but will be very meaningful for developing a new methodology. So that explains in a, in a bit of a rush, uh, everything we're doing around trying to take maximum advantage of the data that's already been collected in Christchurch that data set, as I say, we keep evolving it and developing it and extending it. If we now have a look at how we do our, our work, um, we're very dependent and, and uh, we appreciate greatly the work of the people in uh, Flagship One developing the size finder seismic simulations. Um, I happily acknowledge that I don't really know how this works at all, but uh, as long as my PhD student Mustafa knows how to make it go, that's all I need. So he's working with the flagship one people and the primary Alpine fault scenario is being uh, presented in three different versions. So you can see there in, in color on the right where the, the fault actually sits. The simulations are going to be a, a, a rupture beginning in the north and propagating south, one in the middle going in both directions and one in the south propagating north. And at the moment inside Seismic Finder, the only one that is available currently is beginning in the north and rupturing south. But a neat addition to what um, was um, perceived or con conceived when we put the project together is that the flagship one people are now also doing a number of other faults around the South Island. And although I haven't got it in the slide set here, we're looking at what we refer to as black swan events. So we are also at now able to do things a little bit like the Darfield earthquake itself but have a look at uh, what would happen if we had, for instance, ruptures uh, close to Omaru or Timaru or another such thing. So that's downstream work still to come, but is a little meaningful when I show you what we've been up to lately. So the way Size Finder works is that it has a number of stations or positions across the country. We're focusing here in the South Island, obviously. And uh, at each of these positions, we are able to get uh, seismic shaking parameters coming out. And there's quite an extensive set there, and I don't mean to uh, explain them all to you. Many people in the audience will have at least as much familiarity as I do with these. Um, acceleration is essentially a capture of um, force, velocity, a capture of energy, and AI, if you see it there, is Arius intensity. It is a measure that captures duration. One of the things we haven't yet um, put a lot of effort into, but is an opportunity for us to drill down further, is can we do meaningful correlations around duration of earthquakes and how buildings essentially just bash themselves to pieces after a while in a long duration earthquake, as we would expect for the Alpine fault. 
what you need to appreciate in having a look at the plot on the right is that this does not imply that there are any buildings at these locations. Uh, many of you in the audience will be aware that the West Coast South Island is a rather sparsely populated area. So we have shaking at that point, doesn't necessarily mean there are buildings at those locations. But what we can do is, and this is rather just a quick way of demonstrating or illustrating it, is we can apply any given fragility function at any time to those shaking metrics and now correlate that into building damage. So. What we're showing here is if we had a two-story building and we were wanting to know the probability of it exhibiting um, damage grade four, then we can very quickly grab our, our set of fragility functions and apply them to the information from size finder and start beginning to get a, a, a probability distribution map. I again remind you, this does not imply that there are that many URM buildings that are two stories sitting on the west coast at those locations but does give you a map of what would happen if there was such a building at that position. Hey, John. So uh, when we have all of that together, we put this into the risk scape engine, we hit the go button and out should come the results. And because it's all automated, we can regenerate this more or less at any time. Um, you are in building. <laughs> Someone's not muted somewhere in amongst all of the, uh, the audience. Before we do that, what we want to do once we have the, the size finder simulations finished for Christchurch is the rather obvious thing of running our entire scenario set across all our functions, uh, all our volume loss models, all our debris full zone models, and check that when we put all the inputs in correctly, we get all the outputs correctly. And this um, bottom right picture that you're seeing is just the first capture of having a look at what a debris full zone map might look like. Um, it's a very crude beginning because the circles um, are just simple radiuses of where we're forecasting the damage to be. The radiuses would have to be sitting at the edge of the, um, of the buildings and they're not quite, but uh, certainly that's where we're heading. So moving forward, I just want to explain more to you the other things that are going on and which uh, we job. hope to sort of add as, as companions to the project. I've mentioned to you already, it might seem rather odd it that we, uh, um, sure all that stuff. we've initially you know, uh, dealt with the, uh, excuse me, if someone's there, they might not be aware that uh, someone at least is uh, not on mute. Um, We've focused on the bottom of the North Island, uh, excluding Dunedin. And the reason we've excluded Dunedin, which um, I think, in my opinion, would have by far the largest stock of unreinforced masonry buildings in the South Island, is simply because of the scale of the project we conceived at the time. It would take quite an extensive amount of work well beyond the budget of this project to document Dunedin. But we focused initially on Omaru because of other interests we had around architecture and tourism and a companion project underway with the University of Otago. We then went to Winton in Vicargo um, because of interest from Heritage New Zealand and some work they were doing. Very soon we're going to hit the west coast of the South Island in Nelson, Greymouth, Hokitika, Westport. And uh, we then have another team of people that are going to tackle Queenstown and uh, Timaru later. So just to show you how we're going about it, um, returning now sort of the heritage aspects of this building stock and how this uh, relates to tourism opportunities. We've done a lot of archival work, understanding the early history of these places, what their buildings look like when they were very new and only recently constructed. We've been um, plotting all the data available to us we have uh, been working basically in the central business districts as defined by the areas, but also where appropriate in the heritage precinct zones that are available. So here you can see the zone map for Omaru and um, color coding for different building types. Collecting as much archival information as we can from Heritage New Zealand and other heritage reports. And then we're doing street walkthroughs. And so this is where um, it's a bit low tech, but in the end, nothing beats actually getting there and having a look at these buildings. So for each of uh, 
the cities that we're focusing or towns and cities, we're building these asset inventories. You can see here the number of building counts that we have. For every building, we're collecting as many attributes as we can for this building. So what's its height, what's its footprint, what's its materials, so that we can match all that data to the appropriate fragility functions for these. Um, and this is just the sort of data we have available. It's still evolving, but you can see we're capturing for each building the different material types. Um, and we get a sort of sense of the overall general building stock that we have. This in itself will be very useful to risk scape and uh, risk modeling people in the future, because once the inventory of existing building stock is made available as a, a comprehensive data set, it should have a lot of applicability to people in the future. On top of that, we, um, we started using drones and it was something I was kind of just interested in doing without really knowing what might come from it. But one of the early things we thought would be useful with drones is to be able to fly above the buildings and establish from above if they had parapet securing, because otherwise you'd either have to find some drawings or you'd have to clamber up onto the roof yourself to figure out what was going on behind the parapet. Now, one of the disadvantages of drones is you need uh, flight path permission. You need um, the owner of the building's permission if you fly over the building. Um, and actually, we haven't even bought this drone. It just happens to be one member of our research team had a drone already, so it's sort of just a bit of a freebie on hire. But it's been quite fascinating to me, at least, to see where this has taken us. So we do these drone flybys, and you can see the sort of digital data you can collect. And by putting all this together, along with photographic uh, information where necessary, we can get a three-dimensional point cloud. So now we can actually see the city in color and we can rotate this image and we can see the entire building stock of our precinct, which is a, a pretty neat thing, I think, in its own right. We can get these um, street frontage views and for those that aren't familiar with Omaru, it, it's um, one of New Zealand's leading tourism locations for people interested in building stock of the area because they're such beautiful old buildings. You can see here then also patterns associated with architectural form, building regularity. You can start looking at pounding effects, um, different story heights and how buildings interact with each other. What we've then done is we've accessed the LIDAR point cloud data that you can obtain. This, this data was given to us by Otago Council and you can, although this is sort of from above, so with this data, you don't get a very good sense of the elevation view. You can merge these two data sets now and get more accurate definition of your building. So now you're down to about 100 millimeters, 10 centimeters, and getting a very good sense of the building geometries itself. Okay. At the same time, we've been uh, looking closely at the architectural form of these buildings. This is the work being led by uh, Stacy, And uh, I knew today I was gonna pretty much butcher this part of the presentation because I can never really find the right vocabulary to um, give these buildings the architectural merit they deserve. But we've been having a look at a lot of architectural features. Uh, we've selected a number of case studies and I elected to only show you one today, but for these case studies, what seismic retrofit work have they already had done to them? Was it done uh, in a sympathetic heritage uh, perspective? What heritage solutions are coming from this that will be useful for the future? And uh, many other good things that are coming out of this in terms of architectural form and how we would do seismic improvements that are consistent. I think Mr. AHAS439 needs to mute himself. <laughs> I can mute him? Oh, okay. Hold on. I'm about to mute you. Yeah, chat them. Anyway, I'll keep on rolling because otherwise I'm frightened I won't get through my, uh, my webinar in time. Another thing along the way we've done in Omaru is we've been collecting material data to help us with our seismic modeling. Here's just some examples, but there are a number of seismic retrofit projects happening in town. And so this creates an opportunity to do us uh, more sophisticated work. Um, Omaru is famous for what is referred to as Omaru stone, for those that aren't familiar with it, very large limestone block masonry, which is rather unique to the area. 
And again, we're developing um, building inventory data sets. So uh, Stacey's looking more from a slight heritage perspective rather than just sort of the overall data capture I referred to before. But one of the dimensions of this project is that we are generating large data sets that will be available for others to access. Okay, so we're winding down, pretty much on track. Where to from here? As I mentioned, uh, just in a few weeks time, we're going to now tackle West Coast South Island. Uh, it's an unfortunate feature for the people living there that in the Alpine Fault scenario, they are going to be more or less at ground zero and take a fair old thumping. So it's advantageous, I think, that we've already refined our data capture techniques uh, in some of the other areas. So you can see already we're looking at Greymouth, Hokitika, Nelson, Westport. Uh, and then in our third phase, we're going to tackle Queenstown. For those not familiar, Queenstown's a, a fairly significant tourism site for New Zealand. And then Timaru also has quite a large masonry precinct in the centre of the city. I've mentioned to you already, one of the weaknesses of where we're at currently is the pedestrian modelling. Um, it doesn't seem like a particularly sensible use of uh, researchers' time to clock up hours and hours and hours just walking, watching people walk past. Obviously, where we can, we're working with councils to access whatever pedestrian data they have, but it seems that many councils have got very limited data of their own. We have done some uh, modelling, and, uh, and other than that, I think we'll just be forecasting what would happen for different pedestrian models. The pedestrian side of the project is one that we'll probably need to kin you on into the future, but you can do some pretty nifty things once you start understanding a daytime earthquake, how much might be on the street, and then start um, tracking how this might play out over time. What's going on here? Uh, in conjunction with this, we're looking to do the numerical modeling I referred to right at the very beginning. So we already have the empirical modeling uh, and unreinforced masonry buildings are quite complex to model um, in that they are um, composed of a very large number of discrete elements that sort of are prone to fall apart. We are adopting this discrete element method, which in itself is not new, but is still quite an emerging technique. Um, we're doing experiments at the University of Auckland and correlating that against our modeling. And from there, we hope to be able to start doing numerical modeling of our debris zones and our correct macro block failure modes so that we have everything sort of linking together between the empirical data sets the numerical modeling data sets and the things that we need to do our risk modeling. We're also able to use this to generate numerically generated fragility curves that in a, and hopefully will, will line up reasonably well against empirical observations. Many people in the audience will be aware that, that quite often when you're walking through a post earthquake, you'll, you'll see just things that fail to sort of make sense. Two buildings that look rather similar side by side and one's completely destroyed and the other one seems to sort of survive rather well. So um, there will be features of the empirical data set that uh, will be different, I expect, for the numerical modeling, but that work's progressing uh, quite well. And uh, I think for the future that our team sort of um, strayed on a little by chance, I might suggest, and yet nevertheless has got very excited about is given how well the, uh, the drone footage and the photogrammetry overlaid with the LIDAR is working, we're now wanting to move the LIDAR point cloud data into building information modeling environment, being able to take that point cloud and identify features of buildings uh, develop these into, into models in their own right. Now that we understand the behavior connected with them, we're able to do more modeling around correctly understanding how they'll perform. And then the bottom right is um, just a screen capture from a video game, in this case, after um, some sort of uh, military event. But it's now looking quite plausible that it wouldn't be too hard for us to put a, a seismic input into um, a gaming engine model of a place like Timaru or Greymouth and actually do full simulations of entire blocks or precincts of buildings. And so that's certainly something that we've become very interested in pursuing, understanding that behind sort of the, uh, what you might think of as sort of the rather trivial, lightweight, funky graphics, everything about the model, as much as we can make it, will be rooted in, in uh, proper science and past observation. 
So we've, I think we've, we've gone a long way. We actually promised sort of uh, only a subset of what the project's become. We've managed to overlay quite a lot of extra work on top of it. We've still got a lot of work to do. I don't plan to go through all of this. Um, the one thing, or maybe the two things, the one thing we haven't even begun and it will certainly be a, a big exercise is to try to incorporate the inputs from flagship two around liquefaction and uh, ground failure and how that might impact upon buildings. Greymouth in particular is one site where uh, it's quite possible to have liquefaction effects. That hasn't even yet been begun. And as I mentioned to you already, the pedestrian count fragility casualty modeling work um, will still require a bit more attention. But with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, I might need some help to figure out how we manage the questions, uh, but I'm over. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think we can experiment with questions if uh, anybody wants to um, pose a question from online. Those who have kindly muted yourselves would have to, of course, unmute to uh, pose a question. Well, um, Jason, I, I, uh, thank you for sharing your um, vision as to uh, you know future of video games and uh, um, earthquake-prone buildings all in one place. And uh, I think it's 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 very exciting to see all of the connectivity between the flagships uh, contributing to the um, improved knowledge of the performance of buildings in the Alpine Fault event. Um, uh, I'll just remind people that this is a monthly um, uh, seminar series that, we're, that we've kicked off now, and uh, we've got speakers lined up going straight through till, um, till uh, July or so, uh, but we're looking for, for more. Um, next uh, month, uh, I've left my list at my uh, seat, but uh, next month we have um, Caroline Ortensen uh, talking about AF8. So again, another uh, Alpine fault related uh, effort. And then uh, follow, uh, following month, we've got uh, Kaylee Crawford Flip from uh, Quake Center. Um, and then uh, Joanne Stevenson and, uh, and we've got a few more people lined up. We're trying to identify specific dates. Uh, but anybody on the line who is interested in, in giving a talk, uh, please uh, contact us. And uh, I'm sure we can arrange a future month for you. So uh, unless there's any last questions, I think we'll draw this first uh, Quake Core seminar to a close and uh, successful one it was. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.